Australia's military history is more than just a collection of dates and the locations of war-ravaged battlefields. It is the stories of service and sacrifice of those who have answered the call of their country of birth or adoption and the enduring legacy they have created. Join me as we look into one of those stories. I'm your host, Ross Manuel, and welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, Australia's Military History, a Doc Network podcast. Now let's get started. Evelyn Ernest Owen was born on the 15th of May 1915 in Wollongong, southeast of New South Wales. He was the fourth of five children. The others were David, Julian, Eleanor and Percy, all born to Ernest William Owen and Constance E. McMillan. While he was educated in Wollongong, he didn't appear to have much interest in scholarly pursuits or a desire to follow his family's traditional vocations, with his father being a law clerk and having close family members in both politics and the military. He was, however, like most boys of his age, fascinated with all things mechanical, and in particular, firearms. From a very young age, he was regularly found tinkering with broken shotguns or rifles. Often his experiments were reckless, and he was injured several times. This was especially evident when he dabbled into making homemade explosives, which resulted in him having numerous scars. Not to be deterred, as Owen grew older, he started to focus more on the theory associated with weaponsmithing, and became well-versed in the study of ballistics and taught himself draftsmanship so that he could draw blueprints. In his teens, probably inspired by the Thompson submachine gun and Browning automatic rifle, both weapons designed and built by the United States for the First World War but were too late to see active use, but gained notoriety as weapons made famous by gangsters and moonshiners during the Great Depression in the United States, he moved on from the single-shot weapon and focused his attention on machine guns. Even at this young age, he was able to build a number of his designs, but none were up to his own personal standards. While his family were reportedly very supportive of Owen's tinkering, they on occasion did attempt to steer his passions into other pursuits. In 1931, Owen had started the design and construction of what would become the Owen submachine gun. He was looking for a weapon that had a high rate of fire, was simple to make, did not jam, and was accurate. It would take him until 1938 to finally have a weapon that he was confident to present to the Australian Army for evaluation. In July 1939, on the cusp of the Second World War, Owen travelled to Victoria Barracks in Sydney and demonstrated it to the Australian Army Ordnance Officers, who promptly rejected it. The main reasons given was that the Australian Army saw no value in the submachine gun, and its basic construction was unsuited for military applications, namely its application of a thumb trigger instead of a standard trigger assembly. In fact, when he was asked by the assessing officer what he had, Owen replied with, quote, it's a Tommy gun, unquote, with the officer snapping back, quote, that's an American gangster's gun, the army has no use for those, unquote. Sadly, the Australian army had atrophied in the interwar period, primarily due to a chronic lack of funding, inadequate training, and poor equipment. It would seem that a lot of the innovations and practices that had been developed in the Great War had either been ignored or simply forgotten. While they acknowledged that the threat of war was coming, and with conflict with Japan a possibility, At the time, Australia's defence policy was dominated by the already defunct Singapore strategy, where the defence of Australia we fought away from Australia's shore. It should also be noted that prior to the establishment of the Australian Regular Army in September 1947, the defence of Australia fell primarily to part-time citizen soldiers organised into the Citizens Military Forces, or the Militia, and a small professional cadre of staff officers and technical trades. And with the effects of the Great Depression and the overriding war weariness following the Great War, a steady retrenchment of permanent forces, as well as the reduction in the quotas of militiamen being required to be trained. It became so bad that in 1929, the Australian government suspended the universal training clauses of the 1903 Defence Act, which was what instituted the national service of all eligible men of war fighting age from the ages of 12 to 29. This act left Australia grossly undefended in the unlikely event of enemy attack. With the rejection of the Owen gun, Evelyn Owen, who was working as a motor mechanic, packed his invention in Greece and put it into a sugar bag, leaving it in the garage owned by one of his father's tenants, and on the 28th of May 1940, followed his brothers David, Julian and Percy, and enlisted in the 2nd Australian Imperial Force. He was posted to the 2nd 17th Australian Infantry Battalion on the 8th of June 1940, and it would seem at this time that serendipity would present itself, as the tenant who rented the property from his father would be Vincent A. Wardell, General Manager of Lysat's Port Kembla, an iron and steel plant now known as Blue Scope Steel. Wardell would find the Owen gun still submerged in Greece and was amazed that the action still functioned. After determining the inventor from a thoroughly embarrassed Ernest Owen, 
Wardell sent a telegram to the General Director of Munitions, stating that he discovered a marvellous firearm that was simple in construction and worth taking a look at. So, what changed after the initial rejection? Well, aside from the obvious commencement of the Second World War, it needs to be said that at this point, Australia was still very heavily dependent on Britain when it came to weapons production and development, and while in the 1930s Australia did start a modernisation campaign, most of the Second Australian Imperial Force was being deployed with rifles and equipment that were being used by their fathers and uncles in the First World War. So, following the evacuation of Dunkirk in May-June 1940, with so much war material being left on the beaches of France, meant that a lot of the military equipment destined for Australia and the Dominions had been relocated to the defence of the Home Islands, which necessitated the Australian government seeking out alternatives. And it was the effectiveness of the German-built MP40 that forced the British Empire as a whole, and Australia specifically, to reevaluate their stance on the concept of the machine carbine. On the 25th of June 1941, just as Evelyn Owen was preparing to go to North Africa with the 2nd 17th, he received orders that immediately transferred him to the Central Inventions Board in Melbourne, much to his annoyance, as he wanted to serve alongside his brothers. He would be formally discharged five days later as being required for employment in a reserved occupation and received a promotion to lieutenant. Now, it needs to be said that while the Owen Garden had impressed Wardell and the Central Inventions Board, the army as a whole was not so easily impressed. Owing to that reliance on British equipment I mentioned earlier, the army was anticipating the adoption of the British-made Sten gun, and the Ordnance Board didn't want to sour relations by entertaining competition that had no provenance. Because of this, it is alleged that in attempts to scuttle the Owen gun's design, the army instructed Lysats, who had personally taken the responsibility of backing the costs of developing the Owen gun, to produce weapon prototypes for testing with increasingly difficult or impossible to achieve objectives, such as requiring it to have ammunition that could not be delivered, or endurance tests that could not be tested outside of battlefield conditions. There was even down to intentionally supplying the wrong chamber ammunition to establish designs. In response to these challenges, however, Lysats adapted the design and overcame the roadblocks thrown at them, resulting in six unique variants of the Yohan gun, each chambered in a different caliber or ammunition type. In September 1941, it was finally ready for field testing, and was put up against the American Thompson submachine gun, the British Sten gun, and the German MP18. In those stress tests, the Yohan gun was reportedly more accurate, with a better grouping of shots than any of the other weapons. It also proved itself almost impossible to jam, even when immersed in mud, water, or sand. Even with some initial criticisms, it was initially decided that a 9mm version of the Owen gun would enter into production. John Lysatz was awarded the contract to produce 100 initial units, and eventually produced over 45,477 Owen guns for the Australian Imperial Force, and eventually ceasing production in 1944. It was considered extremely popular while in the jungles of New Guinea and the Pacific, to the point where it gained the nickname the Digger's Darling. New Zealand troops participating in the Guadalcanal and Solomon Island campaigns re reportedly swapped their Thompsons for own guns. So popular was it that it was rumoured that General Douglas MacArthur, Commander-in-Chief of several Allied forces in the Southwest Pacific, considered requisitioning it for American forces in the island hopping campaign. Owen didn't bother initially applying for a patent for his invention in 1942, but did receive £10,000 in royalties for selling the rights to the weapon to the Australian government. With the money he received from the government, he purchased a small sawmill in Tongara on the outskirts of Wollongong and would continue to tinker with firearms, but he never achieved the same level of success he did with the Owen gun. Sadly, he would never marry, and on the April 1st, 1949, Evelyn Onus Owen would pass away at the age of 34 at the Wollongong District Hospital, though the manner of his death is disputed, with sources stating either a ruptured gastric ulcer or heart failure was responsible. He'd be buried at the Wollongong Anglican Cemetery along with other members of his family. His legacy, however, would not end with his passing, as the Owen gun would continue to serve the Australian Army as the standard personal defence weapon for another 20 years. It was especially favoured by helicopter search and rescue crews during the Korean War, and was still used by section leaders and junior officers in that conflict, where they were well sought after during the Battle of Capion, as quoted by Major Ben Dowd of the 3rd Battalion Royal Australian Regiment. Quote, all hell broke loose as diggers cut down the surge of attackers, directing them into as much rapid fire as the weapons could produce. The L1 submachine gun being the most effective weapon for this, and the dear old single shot Lee Enfield the worst. Unquote. It also was used by infantry scouts and commander units during the Vietnam War, 
though by that point it had started to show its age and was retired to a mainline service in 1971, though it had already been rotated out by the mid-1960s. Sadly, Evelyn Owen would receive little recognition for his invention, one that anecdotally saved countless Australian lives, and while his direct military service may have been short, his contribution to the wider war effort cannot be understated. He definitely did more than just his job, and for that we are eternally grateful. And there you have it, that is the life, service and legacy of Private Evelyn Ernest Owen, the creator of the Owen Gun. Catch you next time, friends. Bye. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job Australia's Military History Podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was recorded on the lands of the Gangdangara people whose elders have passed on knowledge for thousands of years, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. This episode was written, researched, produced, directed, and audio engineered by me, Ross, with additional research done by Laurie Favell of My Silent Hero. If you do know someone whose story needs to be told, feel free to leave a comment on an episode or send us an email at IWasOnlyDoingMyJobPod at gmail.com. If you like what we do here and you want to support this podcast, the best thing you can do is share this with a friend or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform as it really helps others find the show. And if you want to join in on the conversation, join us over on Discord. And if you want more content, including show notes, photos, transcripts, and my various adventures finding memorials dotted around Australia, head over to our website at www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on all our social media pages at IWODMJ. Don't worry, there are links to everything in the show notes. Join me personally for more bite-sized history over on TikTok and pretty much everywhere else at Doc Winters. All opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the speaker and do not reflect the views or opinions of any entity, agency, or organization. It is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike 4.0 International License. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.